Hey, good morning. It's good to see everybody. Welcome. Those of you who are here with us in person, thanks for being here and braving the rainy day. And those of you who are online, it's great to have you joining us uh, for worship and all of us being together uh, in this way. Um, I just got a couple of announcements that I want to make before we jump into our, our series this week. And the first one is just to, to let you know we did hypothermia response uh, last week. Um, so I just want to thank our leadership team and the volunteers who pulled that off and did a great job with it. We didn't have nearly as many volunteers as we normally would have for this because normally we would be hosting that here on campus. But because of COVID, it was completely off campus of any churches. It was at a, a permanent fixed site. Uh, they operated it 24-7, uh, and they utilized uh, staff from a couple of the local organizations rather than volunteers from church. But we did provide uh, meal support and some supplies uh, support for them. Uh, so again, thanks for, for being a part of that. Uh, and then our um, Micah 6-8 initiative, we launched that last week. Um, and so if you weren't here last week, I, I really highly recommend you check out that last week's message uh, that Elise led us in and Wendy and Kirsten led us in in their testimonies and their stories of how they're uh, living out uh, the, the passage in Micah 6 8. We're, what we're doing is we're focusing uh, each month on some of our partners that we're connected with just to bring more awareness to you about what, who we're connected with, what they're doing, how you can pray for them, uh, how you can learn more about some of the things that they're taking on and doing in our community and in our world, and even how you can be a part of it. So uh, if, if you missed um, this past week on Micah Monday, we rolled that out um, each month. On the third Monday of each month, we're doing what we call Micah Monday. Uh, where we'll hit social media and give you some links to some, some resources and some ways that you can be connected uh, to some of our different uh, partners. So check that out uh, and be a part of that. I just want to uh, then mention that uh, our food drive was one of the things we highlighted last week. Uh, and our food drive has just been going gangbusters um, since uh, Wendy and Kirsten had the, the vision for this. Wendy, uh, as she told her story last week, Wendy's a high school teacher, and she discovered that some of the, the students in her school were going without food when, when her and some of the teachers emailed them and said, what do you need? Thinking, help with academics. A lot of them responded back and said, we need food. We don't have any food in our house. And so they jumped on that and pulled their resources together and started meeting those needs. Uh, and then Kirsten found herself uh, working or not being able to go into the office and not even being able to work remotely for a good bit of the time when the pandemic started. And so she wanted to, to use her time to make a difference and got connected with a local group. And she's just really helped that group to grow and connect with other groups and bring other churches and folks into the food drive. Uh, today, we've, we've collected since last April, about 10 months, uh, over $85,000 have gone directly to the food drive initiative. Um, and when you calculate in all of the, the items that have actually been donated in person as well, we're well over $100,000 uh, that's been given to this. And as Kirsten told us last week, I think it was um, we've, we've served over 120,000 different individuals uh, since then uh, uh, d through the food drive. So incredible stuff. A part of that, what we're doing the, the next two weeks, we're having kind of a special emphasis on the food drive, on our baby needs drive. Because uh, one of the main things, one of the main requests we get from the families that we're serving around Northern Virginia through this are diaper, diapers and baby wipes. And if you've ever had a baby, you know that you go through diapers and baby wipes like nobody's business, and they cost a fortune, right? It's like taking out a car loan to get your, your diapers and baby wipes. So we're taking the next two weeks to have an emphasis on this. So uh, we want to invite you to be a part of it. And Jenny, one of our leaders in this initiative, is here by video to tell us all about it. So check this out. Good morning, everyone. I'm Jenny Carlozzi, and today I'm here to kick off our baby needs drive in support of our ongoing food drive. Last week, Kirsten Singer spoke about the food drive. So check out the sermon recording in case you missed it. But to recap a bit, since last May, we, Fairfax Circle Church, have been collecting items and funds and dedicating many volunteer hours to support the distribution of food and basic essentials to over 100 families each week. Fairfax Circle Church and Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Fairfax support this effort led by the all-volunteer organization Food Justice DMV, formerly associated with Sanctuary DMV. A majority of the families receiving deliveries have babies, toddlers, and children. And we do our best to ensure that these families have one less thing to worry about with respect to their children. 
So today we're kicking off a baby needs drive running from today until March 14th. And we're excited to share that Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Fairfax and Food Justice DMV are joining us in this effort in advertising and collecting baby needs for the drive. We hope that this effort will stock our pantry with diapers, wipes, baby formula, powdered milk, and other baby essentials that will last us a few months. So the next time you buy groceries or place an Amazon order, consider putting one of these items in your cart. For more detailed information on the items we're collecting to include preferred types of formula, please see the Food Drive webpage on the church's website. Also, for families whose babies are outgrowing diapers, we do accept and pass on open packs of diapers. We also accept handing down clothes, toys, and baby bottles, but we can't accept baby seats or strollers for safety reasons. However, we gladly accept those brand new. Financial contributions are also welcome and can be mailed to the church or you can give online by selecting Food Drive from the drop-down menu on the Give page of the church's website. For more information about the Baby Drive and the Food Drive in general and the full list of desired items, please visit the Food Drive page on the church's website under Serve and Local Missions or visit fairfaxcirclechurch.org slash food dash drive. Finally, as listed on the website, you can drop off non-monetary donations anytime in the bins outside of the church office or skylight room entrance. Or you can also drop off while the church is staffed on Tuesdays and Thursdays, this week and next from noon to four. That's March 2nd, 4th, 9th, and 11th. If you have questions, feel free to email me or Kirsten Singer. Our contact information is on the church website. Kirsten can also provide great information about volunteer opportunities for the food drive, which include things that don't, include, don't increase your contact bubble. We'll report back in a few weeks on the success of this drive, and we're really looking forward to the whole church rallying behind this effort and filling our pantry with baby needs. So thanks for your help and have a great week. Thanks, Jenny. And so be a part of that. Uh, connect with that. Just go right to our website. Or if you got the newsletter this week, there's an article with all of the details and links to all the, the links that, that Jenny mentioned. Um, with that said, let's go to God in prayer this morning. God, we just, we just thank you for just the opportunities that you continue to give us uh, to serve in, in the midst of uh, coronavirus. Um, and in a lot of ways, we, there's things that we just can't do that we normally would do. Um, but we thank you that, that we're allowing us to be a part of of helping other people in our world and in our community, uh, like through hyperthermia response and like our food drive and, and this special baby needs drive. And so, God, we just pray that you would bless it. We pray that you would bless all of those who are leading us, continue to give them uh, wisdom and guidance and how to do that well and how to do that safely. Um, and I just pray that all of us would think about how we can participate in helping to, to meet real needs um, during this, this difficult time. And now, God, I just pray that you'd open our hearts and our minds to what you want us to learn as we look into Judges one more time this week. Uh, and I just pray that we would walk away with the things you want us to know and the things that you want us to do in our lives as your followers. In Christ's name I pray, amen. Well, after a couple of Sundays of being away from our Judges series, we are here to, um, to uh, wrap that up. Today, we're, we're looking at, uh, we've looked at two judges so far. We started with Deborah, who was an incredibly great judge. Um, she was not in it for herself. She was in it for the glory of God. Uh, and then we moved on to Gideon last time. We talked about Gideon, and Gideon wasn't a bad judge. He wasn't a great judge either. He was just kind of right in the middle. He did some really good things and incredible things, and God used him in some significant ways. He didn't have the best ending, so you might want to check out his story if, if you missed that. Today we're going to look at someone who is probably the most famous of all the Israelite judges. His name is Samson. And if you grew up in church, if you grew up in Sunday school, you've heard the story of Samson. You know he's famous for his strength. Um, there are actual battles that Samson won single-handedly. I mean, he, he took on hundreds and hundreds of soldiers and won. Samson was basically a one-man wrecking crew. Okay, And, and, and here's, a, here's a little backstory. Uh, to, to, uh, on Samson that, that leads us to what we're going to talk about today and, and gives you some context that sometimes kind of gets missed 
in Samson's story. And one of the things was that, that Samson's mother, who uh, the only thing we know about her, she's only identified in Scripture as Manoah's wife. That's all we know about his mother. But for a long time, she'd been trying to have children, but hadn't been able to. And then one day, uh, the text tells us that an angel of the Lord appeared to her and tells her that she's going to have a baby boy and that, that he's going to be set aside for a holy purpose, that, that, he's gonna be, that God's going to raise him up as a judge, a deliverer for Israel, and, and he's going to deliver them from their current oppressor, and their current oppressors were the Philistines. You've heard of the Philistines. Goliath was a Philistine, right? And so Samson, Samson is born... He grows up, and one day he meets this beautiful Philistine woman, and he falls in love with her, and he wants to get married to her. And, and since in, in those days and in that culture, all the marriages were arranged by the parents, Samson goes to his dad, and he asks his dad to arrange for him to marry this Philistine woman. And his dad does it, but does it reluctantly. He doesn't really want to, because they're Israelites, and she's a Philistine, and God has told them not to marry the Philistine, because it comes with a whole lot of potential problems when you, when you marry people of other faith and, and all of that in that culture. So he marries her, and at the wedding, and, and keep in mind that, that Samson was strong, but he wasn't all that bright, okay? And, and, and he's at, at his wedding, and he's feeling really, really confident about himself, and, and he's marrying this, you know, this beautiful woman, and it's at his wedding, and, and, and Samson was a bit of an instigator, you know what I mean? And, and so he, at his wedding, he makes this bet with 30 Philistine soldiers, and he bets them that they cannot solve this riddle that he has for them to solve. And, and if they win, the bet is this, if they win, then Samson will give, them, will give them 30 new sets of linen garments and 30 new sets of, of clothes, right? So uh, with these young guys, it's, it's all about the clothes, right? Not a lot has changed, has it? Uh, and so if, if they lose, they have to do the same thing for Samson. They have to give him 30 sets of new clothes. And so these 30 guys, they take on the bet, and for three days, three days, they put their heads together and they try to solve this riddle, but they can't solve it, and they're so frustrated, and they're so humiliated by it. I mean, I mean, here's this Israelite guy. He's coming in. He's marrying one of their own. You know, he's embarrassing them in their own territory and all of this. And so they're just angry about this. And so on the fourth day of this bet, they go to Samson's wife and they threaten to kill her and her father and burn down their house unless she, does, unless she helps them find out the answer to this riddle, gets it from Samson and gives it to them. And so for seven days, Samson's wife pleads with him to give her the answer to the riddle. And finally he relents, finally he gives it to her, and, and she immediately goes to these 30 guys, gives them the answer. They immediately goes to Samson and give him the answer. Now, like I said, Samson wasn't the smartest, but he wasn't stupid either. And, and he knows what's going on. He knows they got the answer from his wife, and it just infuriates him. And so he goes, this is Samson, he goes over to another Philistine town, kills 30 guys in that town, and takes their clothes and gives it to these 30 soldiers that he's made the bet with. Like, like here's the, the 30 sets of clothes that I, that I promised you, right? You won the bet. In response to that, Samson's father-in-law, again, a Philistine, he says, he says, you know, I don't want somebody like you married to my daughter. So he takes Samson's wife, his daughter, and, and he gives her to one of these 30 guys that Samson had made this bet with at the party. And, and, and if you're thinking this is really messed up, you're right. This is, this is really messed up. Uh, and in response to that, uh, him taking his, Samson's wife, Samson goes to his father-in-law's home, and he tries to get his wife back. He begs his father-in-law to give him his wife back. When his father-in-law refuses, Samson goes out, catches 300 foxes, ties, their, ties them in pairs by their tails, right, and attaches a torch to each of the pair of foxes, lights the torches, and then lets the foxes go in the fields and in the vineyards of, of the Philistines. And it burns up all their crops and all their vineyards. And when the Philistines find out what Samson has done, that he's the one who's burned down all their crops and all their vineyards, they go and they kill Samson's former wife and his father-in-law, and they burn their house down and burn them in the process. And in response to that, Samson goes on a one-man destruction campaign, and he kills hundreds of Philistines all by himself, and then he goes out and he hides 
in a cave in Judah. Now, eventually, the Philistines put together an army to track Samson down because they want to kill him. And, and, they, and they think it's going to take an entire army uh, to do it because this guy is so strong and he's so powerful and they're so intimidated by him. And when, when the army gets to Judah, this is the land of Israel, that the Israelites live in, the Israelites see this huge army in their land and they get really, really concerned about it, which makes sense. And, and then they find out that the army is there because of what Samson, their judge, has done. And so the Israelite leaders, they go to the Philistine leaders and they say, hey, let us handle this, okay? He's an Israelite. He's, he's our guy. We'll capture him, and then we will, we will turn him over to you, and then you can do whatever you want to with him. And so the Israelites, they, they go to capture Samson, and, and the Scripture tells us they take 3,000 men with them because, again, that's how intimidated they were by Samson. And, and, and that brings us to chapter 15 of the book of Judges. And here's, here's what happens. Then 3,000 men from Judah went down to the cave in the rock of Edom and said to Samson, Don't you realize that the Philistine rulers are rulers over us? What have you done to us? We'll get back to that in a minute. And he answered, I merely did to them what they did to me. And they said to him, We have come to tie you up and hand you over to the Philistines. And Samson said, Swear to me that you won't kill me yourself. Samson doesn't want them to kill him. He wants them to turn him over to the Philistines because he still wants to kill the Philistines. Agreed, they answered. We will only tie you up and hand you over to them. We will not kill you. So they bound him with two new ropes, thinking they're new ropes, right? They're strong. They're not going to break. And led him from the rock, led him out of the cave. Now, there are a lot of things that, that we can learn from Samson's story. In fact, we may spend an entire series on Samson one of these days. But I just want to show you three things that we can learn today. And one of them is this, that violence always leads to more violence unless someone is willing to break the cycle. That violence always leads to more violence unless someone is willing to break the silence, the, the, the cycle. Notice what Samson says when the Israelites' leader asks him why he's doing all this. He, he answers them. He says, I'm just doing to them what they did to me. And, and if you look a verse back from that, that's basically the same thing that the Philistines said as, as to why they're, they're after Samson. We're just doing to him what he's done to us. Samson's, Samson's entire life basically has been about, about retaliation and revenge and, and getting even. And, and, and when you think about it, I mean, that's pretty much how the whole world operates, isn't it? I mean, people, people get hurt, and because they get hurt, they cause hurt to other people. We've all heard that little cliche saying, right? Hurt people hurt people. And, and some of you, you've been damaged by that cycle of hurt. And sometimes it's that we... We hurt the person who hurt us, and it's like, okay, you know, they've hurt me, and, and maybe we don't want to don't outwardly hurt them, but, but kind of in a passive-aggressive way in the things that we say or don't say or the things that we do or, or the way that we do them. Uh, it, it, it's, it's like it's, it's all out of this sense of, of I've been hurt, and, and I kind of want to cause a little bit of that same hurt back to them. And, and sometimes it's pain that, that we just kind of, that gets inflicted uh, forward, especially this especially happens in families. You know, someone gets hurt and they and experience that pain, and then they inflict the same kind of pain. And sometimes they'll swear things like, you know, that's the last thing I ever want to do. I never want to treat them like my parents treated me, or something like that. I never want to hurt them like my parents hurt me. But then they end up hurting their kids the same way their parents hurt them, and then their kids pass that on, and generation, 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 the cycle of hurt continues. And some of you are, are maybe in the middle of that right now. And breaking that cycle of retaliation and hurt, whether it's in a family, in a community, in a nation, wherever it is, breaking that cycle is always the countercultural thing to do. And it's what the Israelites were called to do, and it's what we as followers of Jesus are called to do. But it's, it's always the countercultural thing to do, and it always takes someone who is willing to be hurt and not hurt in return. It's only the, the only way the cycle ever gets broken is if someone who has been hurt is willing to be hurt and not hurt in return. Not hurt the person who hurt them, not hurt someone in their life or in future generations. And Samson was not that kind of deliverer, but he points to a deliverer who was just that. Because like I said on week one, judges, as violent 
and as chaotic uh, and as disturbing at times as a book that it was, it, it is a book that is pointing out what's missing in these judges and in doing so pointing out the ultimate judge, the ultimate deliverer, Jesus. I mean, the whole book of, of Judges is this giant arrow pointing us to Jesus because when Jesus died on the cross, think about it, he, he willingly allowed himself to be hurt without hurting in return. When, when Jesus hung on the cross, most people, I probably, Samson certainly would have said, Father, do, not, do to, unto them what they are doing unto me. But instead, Jesus says, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. On the cross, Jesus, once and for all, for the history of all humankind, broke the cycle of pain broke the cycle of pain begetting pain and hurt begetting hurt. He broke the cycle. And this is why it's so important to follow Jesus. Because it's only through the power that we get by being in a relationship with someone who broke the cycle that allows us to have the courage and the strength to break the cycle too. It's only being in relationship with someone who has been vulnerable enough to break the cycle that we can be vulnerable enough to break the cycle in our families, in our community, in our nation, in our world. And, and some of you, you're doing that right now. And, and that's a big part of, of, of what we're doing as a church. Like we talked about last week with, with many of our ministry partners, uh, we are stepping into, in, into those places where, where there is inequity and there is injustice. And, and we're saying that, that we're going to do everything that we can to stop the cycle of, of violence or neglect or pain or suffering or whatever it is. And so that's the first thing that we learned from second Samson's life. The second thing that we learned is this, that, that the most dangerous kind of bondage is the bondage that you don't know you're in. The most dangerous kind of bondage is the kind of bondage that you don't even know you're in. Uh, this, was, this was actually the most vulnerable time in Israel's history. And, and the reason this was the most vulnerable time in their history is because to them, it didn't seem that bad. In, 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 in some ways... It actually seemed okay. It, it seemed like they, things were pretty good. I mean, if you look back at some of the, the other oppressors that the Israelites had, uh, the other groups that conquered them and enslaved them, uh, they, were, they were much worse. They were much crueler than the Philistines were. And, and because those groups were so cruel, when God would raise up a, a leader, when God would raise up a judge, the Israelites would follow their leadership. They, were, they would muster the courage to overtake and rise up and overthrow their oppressors. But when you get to the Philistines, the Israelites, they have a very different view of the Philistines as their oppressors. I mean, in some ways, they're actually okay with Philistine captivity because for the most part, and certainly compared to all of these other uh, times when, when they were oppressed and in bondage, for the most part, life is pretty good under Philistine rule. And so when they see Samson stirring up trouble with the Philistines and threatening to upset the status quo, they don't want any part of that. You see, what, what made the Philistines so dangerous was not, not their cruelty. What made the Philistines so dangerous was, was their ability to completely absorb and assimilate the Israelites into their culture. In fact, within just a few generations into Philistine captivity, the Israelites would, would become so fully assimilated into the culture that they completely lost their identity, completely lost their sense of, of who they were, their sense of, of calling to be this countercultural community, to follow this one true God. In just a few short generations, they were at risk of losing their entire, gener their entire identity as a, as a nation. And, and the reason the Israelites handed Samson over to the Philistines was not just because Samson was a troublemaker, which he was, but because they handed him over because even though Samson had been called by God to be a judge and called by God to deliver Israel from the, the bondage that they were in, Israel didn't want to be delivered. They, they didn't want to be rescued. And, and the most dangerous kind of bondage is the kind of bondage that you don't know you're in. And it's the kind of bondage that's, that's pretty prevalent in our 21st century post-Christian Western culture that we live in today. It's the kind of bondage that looks like the good life, but actually keeps you from living the good life. It's the kind of bondage that looks like, you know, wow, this is, this is pretty good. This is pretty great. You know, I don't really want things to change all that much. This is, this is what the good life looks like, but it's actually what's keeping you from experiencing the life that God 
created you to live. That, that, that's the kind of bondage that, that you don't know that you're in. And I don't know if you've noticed this, but, but most people in, in our culture today are not looking for a deliverer. Most people are, aren't looking uh, for, a, for a Savior because most people uh, aren't looking for someone to, to remove the chains that they're in because they don't even feel like they're really enslaved by anything. I mean, life is good, and anything or anyone that might upset the status quo, well, that's seen as kind of a threat. And, and this is true for Christians. This is true for the church. I mean, if, if you look back at the history of the church, the church was, has typically been the most effective in reaching its mission in this world when it had the least, when, it, when, when life was the hardest for Christians. But, but that same history shows us that, that when the church has power and when the church has affluence and when it has influence that, and things are going pretty good, it's during those times that, that we've lost our identity as the church, as followers of Jesus, and, and, and we've, we've actually forgotten what our mission in the world was. The third thing we learned from Samson is this, that, that true strength is developed from the inside out. True strength is developed from the inside out. So, so the Israelites, they, they capture Samson, they tie him up with these new ropes, they hand Samson over to the Philistines, but the ropes that bound him were no match for, for his strength, and he breaks free, and he goes out, and he kills a thousand men. And then for the next 20 years, Samson, flawed, immoral Samson, leads Israel. And eventually, he falls in love again. And, and if you grew up in Sunday school, you've heard the story of Samson and Delilah, right? And, and to make a, a long story short, and I encourage you to read Judges 15 and 16 and read this story for yourself, but to make a long story short, some of the leaders of the Philistines, they go to Delilah, and they offer to pay her what would basically be equivalent to about $15 million today if she can find out what the source of Samson's strength is, where the source of his strength comes from. And so she goes to Samson, and she asks him uh, to tell him where his strength comes from. And, and Samson seems to kind of know what's going on here, if you kind of read between the lines of the text. And he kind of plays this game with her. And, and he tells her, he would tell her where his strength came from, but, but he's basically lying to her. He's just making it up. It, it doesn't really tell her. And, and then he falls asleep, and she does whatever he says uh, would have, she does to him whatever she, he says would, would take away his strength, like tying him up with, with new rope or tying him up with, with these particular types of, of cords or strings. And so he's just playing with her. And then he would wake up, and he would break the ropes or the strings or whatever it is that bound him uh, that was supposed to take away his strength. And this goes on three times. Three times he comes to her. Three times he just plays this game with her, makes it up, and, 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 and this goes on like this. At three times he says, if this happens, you know, I'll lose my strength. And three times he wakes up and breaks free. And the Philistines still haven't captured him. And so finally, a fourth time, Samson is still playing this game with Delilah. And he tells her that as a part of a, of a Nazarite vow that he has taken when he was a young man, that his hair has never been cut. And if she cuts his hair, he will lose all of his strength. So when Samson goes to, goes to sleep, Delilah shaves his head. Now, I've always kind of wondered why he didn't wake up, right? I mean, how do you sleep through getting your head shaved? I, I don't know. We don't know. The text doesn't tell us. But, and, and this time when, when Samson wakes up, his strength is gone. And, and he's in, he ends up being captured. Now, here's the interesting thing about this story, and this is the part of the story that we generally get wrong. It's pretty clear that Samson doesn't know that his strength has anything to do with his hair. When, when we tell the story, it's usually like, you know, he was in love with her, and so he finally decided to trust her, so he tells her where his true strength comes from. But the chances are pretty good that, that he's just really still trying to mess with her and still uh, just playing this game with her. Because the text tells us that, that when he woke up, he was expecting to do the same thing that he had done before those other three times where he just had the strength to break free from whatever bound him. But, but this is what happened. Then she called, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. And this is what she would do all three times, four times. He, he woke from his sleep and thought, I'll go out as before and shake myself free. But he did not know, and here it is, he did not know that the Lord had left him. See, the reality is, Samson didn't know where his strength came from, right? I mean, he just, 
he really just thought it came from himself. And he, he just thought that, that it was because he was Samson. And, and Samson is strong and powerful, and that's just who Samson is. He, he kind of thought his strength just came from all, all from himself. And, and his strength didn't actually come from his hair. Here's the backstory of, of his hair and all that. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Samson's mom and told her that, that he was going to be set apart for God's work, part of, part of the outward declaration of that set-apartness was the taking of what was known as the Nazarite vow. And, and the Nazarite vow involved making three commitments. And, and one was, was keeping oneself ceremonially clean by never touching a dead body. The second was never to drink alcohol, and the third was never cut one's hair. And, and, and there were reasons for all three of those things. We don't really have time to go into to the reason behind them, but, but those were the three commitments that Samson would have made when he took this Nazarite vow as a young man. Never touch a dead body, never drink alcohol, and never cut your hair. Now, even though Samson had committed to all of those things when he was a young man, he had taken the Nazarite vow and had committed to, to all those things. He regularly violated two of them. I mean, given all of the fighting and all the killing that he had done, he had definitely touched a dead body, probably lots of them. And, and it's very likely, given all the partying that he did, he drank a good bit of alcohol. And the only part of the vow that he had kept up to this point was not cutting his hair. So, so only one of the three parts of the vow had he kept, and now um, as, a, as a part of this silly little game that he's playing with Delilah, he lets her cut his hair, right? I mean, no big deal. He doesn't care. I mean, he's violated the other two, two commitments, and, and now he says, sure, go ahead, cut my hair. And the, reason, the reason Samson lost his strength was not because he gave up his hair. It was because he'd given up on God. That, that's why he lost his strength. He had, he had completely and totally turned his back on the vows that he'd made to God. He had completely and totally turned his back on the calling that God had put on his life. And sometimes, if we're honest, sometimes we're a lot like Samson in that sense. I mean, we think that, that our success is just all about us. And, and especially living here in the D.C. metro area, it's, it's so easy to fall in this trap. This, this is a big part of of this culture because there's just so many successful people in this area, right? And sometimes we think that our success is because of us, that it's, that it's because of our strengths and our gifts and our talents, the fact that, that we're smarter than the next person and our background, our education and what we've done and, and, and all of that stuff. And like Samson, we tend to pay more attention to what's happening on the outside than what's happening on the inside. But what Samson's life teaches us is that, that our, if our inner life doesn't match our outer life, then eventually it all comes crashing down, and that's certainly what happens to Samson. I mean, he's, he's captured. If you go back and read the story, he's captured by the Philistines. They've gouged his eyes out to humiliate him. He's, he's thrown into prison to rot, and he's never able to move past the hatred and the retaliation and the revenge that has so consumed his life. And his life tragically ends in one final act of mass destruction where he actually kills more Philistines in his death than he ever did in his life. It, it's a pointed illustration of what can happen when our outer life doesn't match our inner life or of what can happen when, when we're more focused on our performance and our accomplishments and our successes than what's going on on the inside of our soul. And, and while our story may, may never be as dramatic as Samson's story was, the consequences of, of ignoring the health of our soul is really no less tragic. And, and, and that's why one of the most important questions we can ask ourselves is, is what is the condition of my soul? Is it well with my soul? What's going on on the inside? So let me just close this message. Let me close this series with three questions, and they're questions from Samson's life. And the first, first one is this. Are you, are you continuing a cycle of hurt in your life? Are you continuing some kind of cycle of hurt in, in your life? Someone hurt you maybe a long time ago, maybe recently. Maybe it's ongoing. And because of that hurt, you're causing hurt to others. Or you're, or you're, you're actually contemplating hurting someone else. And, and if that's you, you have an opportunity through the strength of Christ to break that cycle. 
And, and the second question is, is this. Are you in bondage in, in some way? Maybe you don't realize it, or, or maybe you just don't want to admit it. That, that is there something in your life or in your lifestyle that's keeping you from being what God created you to be, from doing what God has called you to do, but you don't want to do anything about it because the status quo feels pretty good. And then finally, does your inner life, does it match your outer life? Are, are you focused on the health of your soul, on the health of your relationship with your Creator and with your Savior as much as you're focused on the other things? Or are you relying on your own strength and your own successes and your own achievements? Where do you need to make a move? Where, where do you need to take a step in relationship to you and Jesus? Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, we, I just want to thank you for for Samson's life, as challenging and as difficult as it was, it, it teaches us a lot of things that we can apply to our own life. Uh, and, and God, so I pray that we would learn the lessons from Samson. And, and I pray that we would recognize when, when things have us tied down, when things have us in bondage, and maybe we don't even really realize it, or maybe we just don't want to even recognize it. And then, God, we've, we've all been hurt. We've all fallen into to the cycle of hurt in our lives, where, where we're hurt, and so we decide to hurt someone back, or or we've been hurt by someone, and so we kind of pay that forward in our relationships and in future generations. So God, I pray that we would all be people who would, who would work so hard to break the cycle of hurt, starting with ourselves. And then God, I pray that, that our, our, our inner lives would always match our outer lives, that we would be as focused, if not more focused, on our soul, the health of our soul, the health of our relationship with you as we are, all of our achievements, all of the things that we do, whether they're for ourselves or whether they're in your name. And God, so I pray that you, we would walk through some of these steps that we need to take today and that we would be better for it. God, thank you for the book of Judges. Uh, thank you for what it teaches us about how we can live our lives today. But more importantly, thank you that it's a giant arrow pointing to the day when you would step foot on this earth and you would demonstrate what a real deliverer, what a real Savior looks like. So we thank you and we praise you for that. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. I want to thank you for being here today. I just want to remind you of, of two things. First, Micah 8. Check that stuff out on our website. We have a whole website or page uh, dedicated to that. It's also on our social media feeds. And, and be a part. Connect with, with the Lamb Center. Connect with the food drive. Uh, and then don't forget our baby needs drive. Uh, and be a part of that. Go grab some diapers the next time you're in a store. Or if you're on Amazon, you can go and, and order them. You can have them shipped straight to us if you want to do that. A lot of people have done that over the last few months. Or maybe you just want to give financially to the food drive. You can do that uh, as well. And, and we'll put that money towards a lot of the baby, baby needs stuff. Uh, so be a part of that as, as you feel led to be a part of that. I hope you have a great week. I hope to see you back next week. Uh, Susan's going to lead us out with some songs.